which was just totally shocking to me, totally flabbergasting. And, I, and, it, and it put in relief for me uh, what we have built in, not just in the Bay Area, but I think it's, it's extreme here, in that it's a world where people who are willing to work extremely hard like this guy live in his car literally to make a living are actually forced because of the cost of housing, and this, that was why he was living in Mexico, to, and he's an American citizen, to, to live so far away from their workplace. And this was an extreme example, but it got me thinking about the relationship between mobility and how people get to work and how people connect with economic opportunity. Um, so I put together this great panel, and I will quickly run through their bios for you today, and then we'll start talking. And since this is a small group that we've got here, uh, I would like to keep the conversation lively and interactive. So if somebody says something up here that you want to respond to, put your hand up, and we'll try to call on you. Uh, I only ask that you not filibuster. So if you've got something to say, say it, make a point, um, but uh, you know, let's, let's keep things moving. Um, all right, so I'll start here with Julie. Uh, so Julie, uh, line is that is that how we say the, li uh, the last name? Lean, lean? like lean. lean on me. Like lean on me. Okay, sorry. Um, <laughs> so Julie, I actually know Julie. I should know how to say her last name. Uh, but she's a co-founder of a venture fund called the Urban Innovation Fund, uh, and uh, she also previously founded an urban ventures accelerator program called Tummel. Um, both of those programs invest in companies uh, that are trying to solve challenges associated with uh, the future of cities. Um, and in particular focused on uh, challenges related to equity. Uh, sitting next to her, we've got Cynthia Wong, uh, who's the executive director of Bay Area LISC. Um, Bay Area LISC works towards uh, driving affordable housing and economic development in the Bay Area region. Uh, Cynthia used to be a VP um, at Morgan Stanley, where she created uh, the, the uh, Morgan Stanley's Institute for Sustainable Investing and helped launch that. Uh, prior to that, she worked at Bridgespan Group, um, and she's had this great history, I think, in a lot of different areas around the impact space. Uh, sitting next to her is Calvin Gladney. Uh, Calvin is the president and CEO of Smart Growth America. Uh, prior to being at Smart Growth America, where he's really working on equitable and sustainable communities all over the country, he was actually the managing partner of Mosaic Urban Partners, which uh, is a real estate advisory services and development company. Calvin has worked in 25 different cities around the country over the last 10 years working on these kinds of issues. Um, and then sitting all the way at the end is Michael Weinberg, who's the president of the Bay Area Council Economic Institute, uh, which is the leading think tank focused on the most critical issues here in the Bay Area. Um, he manages a team of professional researchers, and I encourage you to go to their website and take a look at some of their research. It's pretty amazing. Uh, so with that, uh, let's kick off the discussion. Calvin, I thought maybe you could set the scene uh, with sort of framing what equity means to you in the context of mobility um, and, you know, what types of equity is, is meaningful when we're talking about mobility and how people get around. Okay. Um, well, maybe I'll start with a story. How many people here have been to Brooklyn? Okay, good. How many people here have been to Coney Island? So I'm going to be the only person you've ever met who actually grew up in Coney Island. So I like to tell people, don't let the pocket square fool you. I grew up in public housing, on welfare, food stamps in Coney Island. Been blessed and lucky since then. Um, but if you know anything about Coney Island, and you think about the context of mobility and equity, so I got an internship in Manhattan. And Coney Island, just if you're looking at the map, is the most southern part of Brooklyn. All the trains in there. Um, but I would have to get up at 4 a.m. to get to work in Manhattan at 9 a.m. Because if you live in Coney Island, either you're going to walk, depending on where you live in Coney Island. Actually, you hear my New York accent when I say walk, right? <laughs> um, you'd have to walk 15 to 20 blocks to get to the train station or get on a bus or get what people call a dollar cab to then get on the train for at least a 60-minute train ride to get to Manhattan. And then depending on where you had to go, change trains. And so for me growing up, it always was clear to me that when it came to access to jobs, um, transportation options, and the fact that Coney Island, which is essentially 75% African American and Latino, and probably 80% low income, um, and most folks, probably less than 50% have more than a degree past high school, there's a real challenge when you look at certain neighborhoods and certain racial groups and ethnicities when it comes to mobility and it comes to equity. So one of the things I like to say is, 
you can't talk about mobility and you can't talk about equity without being specific about race. Because the solution set for how you want to deal with these problems really need to be defined by the particular groups. And depending on what type of problem you're trying to solve, the different populations and groups need different solutions. So for me, just personally growing up, I saw all of this stuff. Um, so those are the type of things I think about. Sorry, I'm about to cough. <coughs> Um, in terms of types of equity, though, I did want to break it down because I do think we often talk about equity specifically in terms of outcomes, but I think there's two other things we should also think about, which I'll call decision-making equity and process equity. Uh, so we often say, well, let's make sure this is a particular outcome for these groups and that's an equitable outcome. But part of the challenge is who's at the table making the decisions? You see this in the innovation space as yeah. well technology space, um, so decision-making equity, as well as process equity, who is involved in setting up the process and being involved in the process and giving input, even if they're not a decision-maker. So I do think we need to think about equity not just in terms of the final outcome, but who are the decision-makers and then who's creating the process and being a part of it. Cynthia, I was hoping you could maybe build on that and, and uh, give us a, some thoughts about the particular mobility challenges faced by low-income people and how, you know, income stratifications kind of uh, play out in the, in the mobility space. Yeah. You know, I, I'll build off of what Calvin just said. You know, for the team at Bay Area List, when we think about equity, you know, we think about it in the frame of power. That's really what equity is power, having the decision-making power to have control over one's own life. And so for us here, particularly in the Bay Area, as many of you may have heard, how many of you are Bay Area residents? I'm just curious. All right, we got a good number of Bay Area folks. So I don't need to talk about the housing crisis. We all know about that's going on. Is there a housing crisis? There's a housing crisis. There's like this thing that's kind of overwhelming uh, all yeah. of us here, you know. Um, but, you know, as, as we all see here, um, it, it really is affecting everyone, but it's disproportionately affecting um, are low and modern income communities. Um, and so as we think about the displacement risks that are, that are happening, uh, here at LISC, we're, we're being very deliberate and intentional and in working with our community partners, working with our development partners, and working with our, over at SOCAP, our investors, um, and thinking about, okay, what are the development strategies? What are the development products that we can offer that really have these concerns of displacement and of advancing development without displacement at the core? Micah, can you sort of frame that and the work that Bay Area LISC is doing in the context of the regional economy and you know, thinking about what, what are the impacts to the region, not just on low-income people directly that they, you know, it's hard to get where they want to go, um, but what are, what are the impacts that everybody is feeling as a consequence of it being hard to get around? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, we look, uh, for example, at uh, a, a number of mega commuters in the Bay Area. Now, I didn't realize that some of those mega commuters are actually coming from Tijuana. Uh, <laughs> wow, uh, that is that is that is new to me. Um, but uh, but many of them are coming from the Central Valley, or they're coming from Northern California, or they're coming, um, you know, from Monterey. Uh, there are buses that are run from uh, UCSF every day to east of Sacramento. Uh, to get people to work on, uh, on staff at the UCSF hospital. Not specific to UCSF, but that's just one example of the employers that we work with and what they have to do to get people from where they can afford to live to where they actually work. And it has a, a, a huge impact on these people, obviously. It has a huge impact on their communities because when you're mega commuting, you're not at home with your family. You're not you know, creating the social fabric, you know, creating civic institutions and so on. So that's a big issue, and then it has you know cascading effects. So the you know transportation networks are snarled. People say, well, we can't build more housing uh, because we've got uh, you know these uh, bad traffic. But if the housing is being built two hours away and people are using those transportation networks, then that's not actually putting us in a better situation. So it's obviously extraordinarily important for. Uh, the specific people that we're talking about, but it also has ripple effects within the broader economy. Does anyone else want to add anything on that before I kind of shift gears a little bit? No. Uh, so, Julie, I, I was hoping you could talk. I, I know that you know there, there's the the broad picture in terms of what's happening, and I think we've got a pretty clear picture about that. Can you talk a little bit about 
some of the companies that you're seeing in the space and some of the um, maybe the challenges to finding companies that can uh, contribute to a solution to this problem that, that might you know potentially be able to ameliorate some of these issues? Yeah, and I think that this is actually quite a controversial topic in some ways. I mean, how many of you would say that technology has been a positive force for transportation? Okay, good. But it isn't without its controversy in some ways, right? Because, you know, you have this double-sided, uh, you know, double-edged sword with uh, ride-sharing, for example. So, you know, you've got people being employed as drivers, but on the flip side, you have folks coming in from Tijuana, Mexico, you know, living this kind of lifestyle that we don't consider to be particularly healthy or maybe vibrant in some ways. Um, so, you know, there are downsides with technology. When we evaluate startups um, in the transportation space, one thing that we look for is intentionality around not only creating solutions for city dwellers, but making sure that those city dwellers aren't just the most affluent, the 1%, making sure that they can be applicable across many residents in a city. So a good example of that, um, we were the earliest investor in a company based here in the Bay Area called Chariot. Maybe you guys have seen their bright vans around the city. Um, I would describe them as a commuter shuttle service that's somewhere between municipal transit bus lines and the peer-to-peer uh, -peer solutions in ride sharing. So they essentially aggregate groups of users to do this commuter shuttle. And you can get commuter shuttle routes operational within your neighborhood um, very quickly. And what I think they did really well is it make sure that they were applicable to all city residents. So they integrated with public benefits programs like WageWorks, so they were price comparable and affordable to many groups of people. They also employed um, low and moderate income drivers, and so they ended up hiring about 150 drivers from within the community um, within their first two years of operations. So within two years, I think they actually amassed a lot of city credibility because they were actually in, um, engaging with stakeholders, the local supervisors, local community groups, and they ended up being the last uh, commuter shuttle left standing, and actually they got acquired by Ford less than two years after their initial launch to build out Ford's smart mobility line. So you can now find Chariot across about a dozen cities in the US and London, which is really exciting. And I think that's a great example of, you know, it, not all transit solutions will be everything for everybody, but trying to have an, a lens toward all city residents, creating good jobs, providing um, W-2 full-time employment instead of 1099 contract work. These are all things that good employers can do, and being proactive about trying to help startups do that can make a real difference. Yeah, so I think, I think Chariot is great, and I think these com the, 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 the shuttles that the companies send out are sort of necessary, but it's a weird solution, right? I mean, like, it's sort of, we're doing that because on some level we can't do public transportation well in the country. And so we did this, uh, you know, project, um, you know, called the Young Men of Color Employment Partnership, where we were specifically looking at getting you know, young men, primarily African American and Latino, into jobs at our employers, and just the the transportation connectivity, and especially the transportation connectivity through public transit, is huge. Um, you know, there was a, a UPS facility that was paying a couple of dollars an hour more than another one, but it wasn't transit served. And so, you know, the young men were coming to us and saying, like, this is cost prohibitive. Like, right. and then you look at the academic research, and it shows that right that. Right. The employers that are, you know, served by public transit, especially affordable public transit, you know, just have substantially, you know, more diverse populations and so on. And so it's like, again, I love Chariot. Uh, I believe they may be a member of the Bay Area Council, but it's, it's a weird way to go. We're like, you know, doing these, you know, sort of workarounds to, to, to try to, because we can't do real public transit. Uh, so did you have a question from the audience? 
Kelvin? Yeah. Did yeah. you want to jump in, or uh, Micah, do you want well, to respond? Well, just to real that? quickly to that specific question. Yeah. So it's interesting. A good example of this is the Oakland Airport connector. So, you know, we built the o Oakland Airport connector. It is, um, you know, fairly expensive to use. You know, just like when you go into San Francisco on BART, you know, you end up paying, you know, another eight bucks. It turns out it's cheaper for me and my family to get in a lift from our house, like 15 miles from the airport, if there are three of us, than it is to ride BART to the airport. So there have been real impacts on the public transportation system, especially off hours. It's still as jammed as it ever was uh, during rush hour, but yeah, there has been an impact on the, the sort of uh, revenue and you know, a number of different things from, from having these rideshare services. Can I just jump in and say, I will um, disagree with that respectfully, not because I don't think um, there are challenges to funding public transit. I do think there are many of those. But I would argue that many of the reasons that there are these workaround solutions is because when public transit isn't serving everybody, um, it becomes, and it's not reliable, it becomes much easier to do a workaround. I actually think there's a long history, not just in San Francisco, but in other cities like New York, of having private solutions that then become part of public domain. So for example, the cable car lines, there were, used to be private jitney services a long time ago. And the reason that these become part of the public domain at some point is because they realize that they're getting so much utilization among the population that there actually becomes incentive to start funding some of those services. And Chariot's actually a great example of one that started as direct to consumer and direct to business, and then a city municipal the municipality here actually talked to them about augmenting their night owl service. And so I think that there are ways to integrate the public and private in a way that can be really, I think, um, great for all city residents. Well, I want to jump into this little intellectual slugfest yeah. here. <laughs> and I don't, um, I don't disagree, to be clear. But, um, um, because actually, I'll say that I think both of your responses are myopic. Okay, cool. <laughs> see, see, I come in swinging, right, right. Brooklyn? Um, because we're presupposing that the solution to this mobility problem is a mobility solution. And so what if we said, let's bring more healthcare or jobs or whatever the thing we're trying to access through this better mobility closer to where the people sure. already are? So, you know, my organization is called Smart Growth America, and one of the basic principles of smart growth is to build things more densely and to bring more of the things that people want to the places they already are. Um, so adding to your point about displacement, not only do we need to fight displacement, people are now being displaced in place, right? Because they live in the suburbs already, where a lot of poverty is moving or already exists. And the problem isn't that they're getting kicked out of where they are, it's that there's nothing where they are. So, you know, we, ju we just need to make sure that when we think about all of these issues, mobility issues are, you know, sort of inextricably intertwined with housing issues and are inextricably mm -hmm. intertwined with economic development yeah. issues. And so even whether it's public or private, we need to make sure that we're solving the right problem with not just a solution that's the same topic, but looking at all the ranges of solving the problem. Yeah, couldn't possibly agree with you more. We do a lot of work, uh, you know, in the Central Valley and what we call the Northern California mega region. And they say like, look, if your train, you know, your high speed train is just a mechanism of like getting commuters for the Bay Area, that's not something we're interested in supporting if it can bring economic development to our communities so that we have the resources that we want, you know, to continue to have or to improve Fresno or whatever it is, then we're okay with that. So figuring out that balance is a, is a challenge. But let's call a spade a spade. In an ideal world, sure, we'd build up a dense housing all over transit centers. That has been blocked time and again in the state legislature. It's been blocked by the city. There are a lot of forces at work that are actually preventing dense development around transit areas here in the Bay Area, which is really unfortunate. So the reason we have all these workarounds and people getting around in scooters and e-bikes and you know everything else under the sun is because literally our you know we don't have the policy and political will to do the thing that we all believe is right, which is building dense housing. Yeah, we supported 827, <laughs> so I'm all with you. That sorry, that's like for those of you who aren't you know following. So there there was a bill about essentially making it easier to build. Uh, more dense housing around uh, uh, transit-served areas, and 
We didn't, we didn't quite get there this year. Not but, even close. <laughs> yeah, but we did uh, get a bill allowing BART to develop around its own station. So there's, there's interesting stuff. Sorry, we're getting like crazy into the Bay Area weeds. <laughs> no, we can take it back up to the okay. national okay. Well, I, I'll do that a little bit unless there's someone from the audience who wants to jump in. Uh, Anybody want to get into this little doll? Yeah, right. Am I getting to 827 on the stage? <laughs> Back in time. Okay. There you uh, go. Yeah. There you go. Uh, go back to what Calvin said, and you know, I think you've got to talk about race in this conversation. You know, when you're talking about transportation, and so you take both instances. Um, you know, you're trying to get people to jobs. A lot of resistance. People of color coming into those neighborhoods, and then you know, you start to try to bring jobs to people. Then you got to deal with the issue of gentrification at some point because you have white people that are pushing out people of color. I mean, those are broad, but I think, you know, questions around what are some solutions or some incremental steps to start to break that down? Because I think you've got to get to exposure and, you know, start to build some community where you, where you do have some more large scale solutions. Did anybody want to respond to that? Um, the, the only thing I'll say, and again, this sort of goes back to, you know, are these, as you call them, workarounds, a response to the lack of efficacy of sort of publicly provided services? Um, I think it's fine. I don't think it's an either or sort of thing. But I do think that the public sector has to own and be responsible for the things it's not getting right. And the private sector, irrespective of how it's doing it, to the extent it's doing these work, uh, workarounds, need to also take responsibility for the negative externalities that it's creating. Whether it's a workaround as a solution to a public sector uh, failure or not, it still should be responsible for the things that it's happening, whether it's increasing traffic congestion as a, as a function of ride sharing, or you, know, you can think of five, 10 different things. I just think that there's, it isn't like, because I'm solving a problem because of your failures, I don't have to deal with any of my issues. Um, when you look at some of the microtransit solutions, scooters and the like, you see, and going to this point about race, even in DC, you'll see different adaptation by African Americans in poor neighborhoods if you compare um, dockless bike share versus dockless scooters. And you would say, well, why is that, right? Because that doesn't make any sense. It's kind of the same thing. But when you look at the technology and what it takes to actually get a scooter versus get a dockless bike, it's totally different. And so, and you see those differences specific to race. So um, I think it really comes down to one, understanding that you need to think about these differences. Two, having the data, so having the private and public sector share the data, because I know data is, is really, you know, oftentimes the real game. It's like, I created a company to create the data so somebody can buy me. <laughs> um, but no, I, I wouldn't yeah, say sure. that's probably a little pejorative, but I, I do think that unless we say one, we need to be intentional in understanding these racial differences in terms of what's actually happening. Two, we share the data so we actually know, particularly the public sector, which now, unlike ever before, has less of the data. Like a lot of the aggregate stuff is all housed in private sector organizations. So how do we share that in a way that's reasonable? Um, and then finally saying, once we know that there's some differences that are specific to race, we need to be intentional about solutions that are specific to race, and that's not bad. It's not a zero-sum game to say, well, hey, if there are Asian Americans in the Chinatown neighborhood in Boston, and a lot of them are seniors, the way we solve their mobility problems are gonna be different than young men of color in the Bay Area. It's just going to be different, and we just need to be upfront about that. Julie, do you know whether the folks who are using Chariot and services like that are essentially opting away from public transit to use them, or is it additive to their existing sort of transportation alternatives? So the argument we've always made is augmentation of public services and it being additive, and I think a big part of that has been their cooperation with the SFMTA and with municipal services. They see themselves as a first and last mile solution, and there are a lot of great examples that they've used in their own studies um, to kind of prove that. That said, you know, I hear the argument loud and clear, which is that many of these workaround solutions may ultimately take people away from certain municipal transit. 
Um, I'm not often in the role of being the tech optimist on a panel, and so I'm happy to embrace that right now because usually I'm in these tech circles where people are very myopic about, you know, technology is the panacea for all good. I know that that is not realistic, but I will say that, you know, as a concept, ride sharing did not exist seven years ago. That is crazy and mind blowing how pervasive it's become and how much of a part of everyday life it has become for a lot of people. Not only as an employment opportunity, but for me, I've lived in the city for a long time and you know, I never plan on having a car because I can augment all of my, you know, transit services between rideshare, zip car and you know, the like. Um, I think there are a lot of positive trends that can happen. You know, they show that there are studies saying people in areas that were previously overlooked and you know, high areas of density of lower, neighbor, uh, lower income neighborhoods, uh, neighborhoods with a lot of people of color were previously underserviced by cabs. Now they have a lot more access because of ride sharing. The flip side to Calvin's point, huge congestion problems that are creating a whole other world of hurt. Um, and I, I would say for Chariot, you know, they have created a lot of positive things in the community, I would argue. That said, you know, I think there was a lot of concern from municipal transit that, you know, are you actually removing riders from the system or are you augmenting the, uh, the current services being offered? And when they really bought into the idea that they were augmenting, well, then they said to Chariot, well, here are our 20 lines that we're currently cutting back capacity on. Can you help fill the gaps there? Mm -hmm. And I think that can be a really productive conversation. So I'm happy to take the tech optimist role. That said, um, you know, there are a ton of problems with transportation, which is why I think we're having this conversation. And there are so many elements that are brought in, most importantly, housing and mega commuting that are creating really negative externalities in the system. So I, I think access is a great benefit and is really important. And I would still say that I think with, in many communities, you know, while, you know, if, if someone has a smartphone and we can have our own debate on the digital divide and if someone has a smartphone these days or not, you know, if they have the app, you know, can they actually still afford to have, you know, that ride? Is it something that can really be, uh, you know, an everyday or, you know, a couple times a week occurrence, right? Um, or is it something that they actually rely on, as so many folks rely on, is practically, you know, a daily part of their commute these days? And I would say that, you know, in many of the communities that we serve, it's much more of, of, the, of, of the former in terms of, you know, it's not something that is really actually accessible. Technically accessible, but not actually accessible. And so there seems to be a greater divide then, um, you, know, in, you know, between you know, those who, who can do that and those who can, and that's something that we as LISC are really, really cautious of as we think about just general cost of living and what the, the general everyday experience is like for the community members that we're serving. So, uh, great, and I want to build on that because uh, I, I think there is data suggesting that at least at the level of many of the rideshare companies, I think Steven Zopf did a paper on this for the Cars Center at Stanford about the fact that uh, cancellations by drivers, for example, are more uh, disproportionately affect people with names that are associated with people of color. So the same kinds of discrimination that we've seen in housing and other wow. contexts actually flows all the way down to the individual rideshare driver. Um, and I think that that highlights the fact that maybe we can't, we shouldn't expect necessarily private companies to solve equity challenges that are, you know, pervasive and associated with structural racism, right? That, that's probably a bridge too far. And Cynthia, I'm wondering if you could kind of speak to the fact that, or, or suggest what we should be doing in order to prevent these solutions from widening the divide that we have already. Yeah, I, I think there's a, you know, delineate between, um, you know, taking on the responsibility of solving, let's say, structural racism. Um, Could you just solve that already? Well, I'm, like, I, I just, you know, I'm going to leave it to you, Kelvin. Thank you. <laughs> We're going to need another hour for this yeah, panel. Can you guys um, just... Uh, but versus, <laughs> you know, being aware of the opportunities and risks, you know, that are inherent in their, in their business model. And I think it is, is not just about, um, you know, the moral imperative there, um, but it is about the the economic imperative and thinking about, okay, how can you, in, in the case of what you just mentioned, I have, I would love to actually see this study, Ruben, but you know, that's, that's money that's lost on the table, right? Those are customers that are not being served. Um, and there is a real economic argument, you know, to address that issue beyond obviously the, are you kidding me, WTF, um, if you will, of that, so. Just wanted to add one thing that I think gets lost in all of this. Um, so one of our sort of subgroups is called Transportation for America. And 
one of the things that we're trying to do in the public sector is sort of something that the private sector or, already does, which is actually have performance measures for what you're doing and actually saying, well, you know, the public sector will talk about equity in, in a lot of these issues, but then they'll go invest in transportation and mobility in the same ways that they always right. invest. So when it comes to transportation and mobility, you know, the focus will be level of service, like how is traffic flow or the speed, like how fast can I get from point A to point B? <coughs> Excuse me. <laughs> Sorry. It chokes me up to even think about this <laughs> stuff. Um, but if you use those as your performance measures to see whether you're doing things correctly and simultaneously saying, well, racial equity is important, then you really will never invest in a way that will have the, the impact on structural racism. But if you say up front, well, one, let's look at the social determinants of health for different racial populations. And let's look at those in the context of if we made three alternative types of transportation investments, which ones would better, more positively affect those social determinants of health, you actually might make a different investment decision. And this goes to being an impact conference to say, you know, a lot of funders will fund, you know, sort of the same old things. Um, so beyond it being interconnected, so you might need to fund a housing solution to fix a mobility problem, you also need to think about what are you actually measuring and so when you talk about equity and racial equity, like what are the actual components that would create equity? And then say, what would be the mobility or transportation investments to get to that? And it's usually not the things that we think about because you'll see as an example that um, lower income people of color who work in retail jobs, well, level of service, like how good are we doing things during rush hour? Doesn't really work when you work in a retail job or a restaurant job where you need to be there at 5 a.m. and you need you're getting home after sort of rush hour. Yeah. So you know it's, we it's actually, thinking differently. Yeah, right? we actually ran into that with another one of the employers that the you know the hours they were wanting to have people work weren't served by public transportation in the Bay Area. I mean, but I, I, to be clear, I, I don't think that it you know my concern for what's happening in public transportation is not TNCs. My concern is what's happening with public transportation. What is, is TNCs? Oh, sorry, the uh, the transportation network companies, the you know ride hailing uh, services. It's that we're not actually funding transportation in the country, right? I mean, like you know, let's let's you know, I mean, po right. whatever our goals would be, right. we can't achieve them because we're not actually building our infrastructure currently. And to the extent that we are, it's done by like bizarre formula that isn't, you know, sort of efficient for, you know, for achieving any particular type of goal. In the Bay Area, it costs a billion dollars to, buy, to, to build a mile of BART, you know, like that's the actual problem with getting our infrastructure built, like here in the Bay Area. I think it's the same number in New York for yeah. the subway yeah. for the... So, like, you know, let's, let's just be fairly clear about that. So and whoever wins the mega millions could just buy a mile of BART? That <laughs> is not likely going to be the thing they choose, but like it would be super publicly spirited. <laughs> but can we also just acknowledge something which is not only a lack of uh, funding for it and the fact that the funding costs are astronomically high, but you know, when it comes to government, what they really care about are, is safety, access, and fairness. They are not known for efficiency. When they create solutions for transit, they want to make sure that it has accessibility to everybody, that it's safe, and there's fairness and equity lens to it, which is extremely laudable. But what happens is that you don't end up creating the most efficient solutions. And I would argue that one of the reasons many people don't use bus lines is because when they're built out, they often stop at every single stoplight because you want to make it accessible for all businesses. There are a lot of groups that go into lobbying for it. And so what ends up happening is you naturally build these workarounds, as we've right. been calling them, because efficiency isn't the ultimate objective when it comes to building a lot of these solutions. And that's okay, but it, in, in a great, you know, uh, utopia type of world, of course, public transit would offer all solutions for everybody. It would get us to from point A to B really quickly. It would be super efficient and reliable, and we could all use that. But that's never been shown but to we, work. But look, we, okay. So we're not an especially serious country right now. How many, how many people have been to China recently? Okay, that's a serious country. So, you know, while we've done whatever the hell we've been Can doing- Can you define what you mean by a serious <laughs> what country? That's that's country. Not, that's so, uh, so there's- All a, of us are like, so, yeah, well, no, so there's a city and it's called Suzhou. 
Uh, it's in China, it's got over 10 million people. Most people in the United States have not actually heard about it. Since 2016, they've created a subway system with 96 stops that you know what is actually super good. So if you've been to like this, oh, well, you know, it's like they do, no, actually it's better than any subway system that I've been on in the United States, right? And that kind of public infrastructure is something we don't do in the United States anymore. And this has nothing to do with communism versus capitalism. We used to do this shit. We used to actually build, sorry, I don't know if we're allowed to cuss <laughs> for an NPR or something, but like, uh, you know, we used to actually do that in the United States and our, like, our unwillingness to continue to build the type of public infrastructure that would help create equity through creating economic opportunity for people to you know, access these jobs and like, live in these communities isn't something we do anymore. But like a, also, China has been one of the most active users of ride sharing with Diddy. Oh, yeah. And they've built out dockless bike sharing as one of the most uh, commonly used forms of uh, transportation to get around. So what I would argue is, I totally agree. I would love to see major investment in public infrastructure, but that doesn't mean these other alternative solutions aren't still a part of the transit landscape. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, there's just but, a, but I think what, what was those, were those both myopic? <laughs> I don't know. You came in earlier, like swinging out, like you yes. Know. <laughs> um, and I'll, since you teed that up, I mean, to me, part of the challenge is something you just said, and hate to focus on something you just said, which is it's not the most efficient way to get from A to B. Yeah. Um, but if you look at traffic fatality, fatality data, pedestrian deaths, if you think of all of the externalities that come from creating the most efficiencies, it's not just congestion. More people of color are getting killed by virtue of us trying to figure out how to get people faster to where they want to go. And so I think there's a larger question of if we continue to focus on efficiencies, we'll never get to equity. Because at some point, you actually need to have a level of service that gets to where people are. And if the poor people are in a place where it's stop number 96, and that will create inefficiencies in the system, then either you have to decide the priority is equity to these particular, group, particular groups or efficiency. Or if the, you know, the situation is, well, we want to make sure everybody can get as fast as possible between A and B, well, if that cause, the cause of that is more people are going to get hit because, you know, there's a place in uh, Louisville, Kentucky, it's called Dixie Highway. Anybody here from Louisville? Um, and it has a nickname like the Highway of Death or something like that. And there's all these traffic fatalities. And it's one of, you know, if you go to Atlanta or other places where there's these essentially like four or five lane highways in a regular neighborhood, and the particular low-income folks that live in that neighborhood have to get across those, what would be a street, it's like a mini highway, and more, more of them die because we're trying to get people as fast as possible and be as efficient. So at some point, we just have to say, what is our priority? And if it's just efficiency, I think we're going to end up, we're going we're gonna to be deciding to kill more people. That's just what it is. <laughs> I'm especially curious from Calvin, uh, since you work with a lot of cities around the country, have you seen any municipalities uh, really embrace what you're talking about around um, decision-making equity, um, process equity, especially from a racial equity lens, um, which is the touchiest for politicians to actually embrace. Um, have, you seen, have you seen any municipalities actually embrace that uh, on a broad scale with their urban planning decision making? Yeah, um, I mean a great example out here would be Seattle. Um, and you can, you can Google, they, they've created basically both an external and internal set of metrics that they apply to every budget decision, personnel decisions and the like. Um, um, the group Race Forward, I believe, worked with them and GARE actually to create this whole framework for Seattle. Um, that's one example, and maybe that's the progressive example. Um, we just did a webinar with um, the state transportation director in Tennessee, and you know, Tennessee being that bastion of progressiveness. Um, it's a real state. It's a real state. But anybody here from Tennessee? Well, I wasn't going to say anything bad about Tennessee. Actually, what I was going to say <laughs> is what you'll hear in states that aren't considered progressive is they don't use the vocabulary 
but they're still trying to get to the outcomes. So you're not gonna hear them talk about climate change. You're not gonna hear them talk about community revitalization, but they will specifically, actually this webinar, basically they talked about how they tried to get to these outcomes without actually talking about race specifically. And you know, there's a push-pull there, so I think you see different examples um, depending on where you go and kind of where you are on the spectrum, really in a political sense. Um, the other, I would say, variable is really kind of small town and rural areas versus larger metropolitan areas. And in the smaller areas, part of the challenge um, is that they don't have any urban planning expertise. So you'll go to a small, small city or a town and there's no urban planner on staff at all. So a lot of the solutions we talk about are kind of urban planning solutions and it's literally like the mayor who's like a part-time volunteer who's trying to figure these things out. Um, so there's some challenges there because they, if you don't have the urban planning expertise, it's hard to even get to how do you deal with some of the race specific issues. How do we think about like process equity? Like who gets to participate? So for example, you know, we talk about in San Francisco, well, we wanna make sure to have the people in the neighborhoods actually making the decisions about whether to develop in San Francisco. Well, what about all of the African American families that have been displaced from San Francisco that are living in the East Bay? Or what about in the East Bay, what about the teachers for Oakland who are living in Antioch? Like, who actually gets to be around that table is an interesting question. We've decided it should be only the people that live in the neighborhood. Sometimes we feel good about that if it's a certain kind of neighborhood, or angry about that if it's an other kind of neighborhood, but it's the same frickin' thing. And, like, how do we, how do we build in process equity uh, that, that respects the fact that people are in many places? I don't know that I know the answer to that. I mean, I, that's actually, I mean, it's a huge challenge all over the place. And I, and I think what I keep hearing is, you know, this description of a, a bit of a policy gridlock between, you know, uh, an inability to build transportation infrastructure and challenges building housing where the transportation infrastructure exists or other things around where the transportation infrastructure exists. Julie courageously representing the private sector's attempt at at just seeing the, the, the opportunity there and the need to get people from place to place and bridging some of that. Um, and I'm wondering, given the, the sort of focus of this particular conference uh, and Cynthia, some of the work that you've done, whether there is any other role, like I'm a real estate guy, is there a role for the real estate sector and the pri you know, private developers or pr private investors who care about real estate and building things in solving any of these challenges? Or do we, are we just sort of also kind of victims like everybody else? I'm happy to take first crack and then yeah, really let you. And I'm actually gonna tee off a bit of, of, of Micah's question around process equity. What does that really look like? So, you know, for us as, as LISC, and particularly, you know, through our office, you know, we are a community development financial institution. You know, we provide financing and TA to reinforce community leaders and organizations. Um, we're really a, a fund manager, quite frankly, uh, if you take away all the soft stuff. But what is really core to us is community engagement. Um, and so we're looking at efforts on a regional level now. And to your point, Micah, you know, if we're looking at um, what's going on in San Francisco, we're recognizing that there are hundreds of African-American families, thousands, tens of thousands for the past few years, who've left San Francisco, who've moved out to Antioch, to Pittsburgh, so for non-Bay Area folks, really East Contra Costa County, so really far out, commuting maybe an hour, hour and a half back in, best, right? I, have, I actually have one member of my, my team member, um, who our office is in Oakland, he commutes three hours on public transit from Morgan Hill um, to our office every day. Um, but to, and he actually is our community engagement officer and can speak from that personal perspective. And so we are looking at a regional level, you know, who are the community residents, who are the community leaders, what are the, the CDCs, the community development corporations, you know, what are the key institutions um, that you think of that are informally but are really holders of power, like for example, churches and, um, and other social structures. How do we think about including that voice into the fund? So how does that, what does that mean for how we think about the investment products the fund offers? How does that think about, you know, what screens we have for what investment projects and what investees we take a closer look at? Um, how do we how do we think about that in terms of talking about our investments? You know, with the community, um, you know, before approval even, 
uh, which is, you know, dicey as, as Julie talked about, um, you know, in, in kind of the hyper-political atmosphere that is in the Bay Area, to how do we talk about what investments we make afterwards and making sure that we're, we're learning um, from the investment and really getting a hands-on first-person account from the community who's being affected by these investments as to, you know, has this actually led to XYZ positive impact or has this unintentionally um, led to some other type of inequity? So there are all these other factors that we think about um, from the list perspective being as a fund manager, um, you know, how do we really drive equity and think about it through that process equity lens? Um, well, I'll make two points. One, on the process equity side, I think we leave out small business owners when we talk about community engagement. And if you think about it, many small business owners actually are in that neighborhood more than residents. They're there 12, 14 hours a day. Where you're a resident, you sort of live, you sleep there. But in terms of actual time spent and seeing what's happening, Oftentimes, small business owners are there more often, and our community engagement processes are often set up at the time where they're doing their thing. Right. And so we never get their input at all, and particularly on urban corridors or transportation corridors, whether it's urban or not, those small business owners have some thoughts and probably some good insights on what would be useful and helpful, and so we do need to broaden our engagement to include them, even if sometimes it's going to them. Yeah. Um, I would also say vis-a-vis -vis this concept uh, or this conference, we need to invest differently. So Smart Growth America, we have a, we've created a coalition of kind of smart growth, dense development um, focused or TOD developers around the country called Locus. Um, and part of our goal is to say, well, if we want to do real estate differently and we think ETOD is important, um, we need to go out and find the like-minded real estate developers who are private sector, they're not mission-based, they're profit-oriented, but they understand and believe as well as some of these place-based things that we think about actually can be positive for their ROI or their IRRs, whatever, you know. It can be mission-based and profit-oriented, be real clear on that. <laughs> right. Real clear. Yeah. And I know that because I worked at Bridge, right? I know, that's what's um, saying. You were, you were at I'm the top. But I'm making the point that we... Even though that is true, you can go find folks that don't have a mission basis at all and still talk to them specifically about how the things that we would want done could be done and actually help them. But we actually need to have funders go and invest in those folks and create peer networks among, among those folks to say, well, how did you get through the entitlement process in the Bay Area to get those units done? And how did you spend the money to figure out how to pay for that pedestrian infrastructure, even though your equity doesn't usually pay for those type of things? Like, they look at your soft cost and hard cost budgets, and they're like, well, I'm not paying for this, this, and this. And you're like, well, one, that's necessary for my returns. Two, the public sector is requiring it. And debt and equity is like, well, I'm not paying for that stuff. That seems like superfluous. So I think some of it is if you're a funder, you're a foundation, organization like yours, needs to think about what you invest and say, if we want a certain type of housing, we also need to invest in these kind of wraparound things that help the housing and not just the housing itself. So we're thinking about production of units. There's some investment that needs to happen there, but if you invest in this other place-based stuff, whether it's the stuff itself, the infrastructure that kind of no one wants to pay for, and everyone's like, no, that's your job, public sector, and the public sector is like, no, private sector, if you want to do this, then you're going to have to pay for it. Like, I think that's an investment place that kind of, there's a gap there that could be filled. Um, but then also thinking about not just investing in that infrastructure, but investing in the type of real estate developers, private sector, sector equity providers who have this mentality already. So as opposed to like, you know, beating your head against the wall and trying to change purely profit motive, motive, motivated folks to do something totally differently, well, why don't you just find the folks that already think that way, whether they're mission-based or not, and invest in them? Um, so there's some difference in how we invest that needs to happen. I, I just want to throw something out there, which is we just spent a long time acknowledging the community role and how to engage the community in order to build the best, you know, kind of solutions. But that said, we also said the best examples of public infrastructure building happened in China, where, frankly, there's not a lot of community engagement happening. So I, I want to acknowledge the mm -hmm. fact that when you do engage the community, when you try to bring in these different voices, it inherently slows down the process, makes it less efficient. And that's okay, because what we're, the trade-off here is we want community voices involved in the transit and real estate development of our cities. I, I mean, 
I, I, I think it's a harder problem than we want to think that it is. So, you know, we, we do a lot of work with Urban Strategies Council, and they've, you know, been working with you know, the Aspen, you know, Opportunity folks, and, you know, they talked about really the problem with, uh, you know, paternalism and equity, right? That, like, we know what's good for you, so here's the outcome that we're going to, uh, you know, we're going to advance, and so we want to make sure to get all these people around the table. We don't want to presuppose that process equity will necessarily produce outcomes equity. I'm not suggesting that it won't, but they're not, auto, you know, it's, I think it's a harder question than we, uh, than we, than we want to think that it is. Um, okay, so I'm getting uh, waved from the back. I want to just, uh, is there anyone from the audience that has a question just as we wrap up here? Um, and if not, uh, I want to, oh. oh, we got one? I've got time until they... I got in a little late. You may have addressed this already, but this is really the issue of people, lower-income uh, workers, uh, computing two hours into the Bay Area. And so I know there's long-term solutions you've been discussing, but what about short-term solutions? Are there any kind of um, ride-share, chariot kind of things being investigated for people commuting from Modesto to San Jose, et cetera, et cetera? Because I work in the food sector and where wages are... 64% lower than the average wage, and this is really the factor. And it's a major issue for these businesses being viable and trying to stay in cities um, in San Jose when they're, all their workers are coming in from Tracy. So. Right. So and lo we, looking we, for what, what can we do in the next three years before we... Yeah, kind of well, we can do some awesome private sector workarounds. But, the, <laughs> um, but we've actually thought about this a lot, which is, you know, you've got all of these... Um, you know, individual companies with their individual buses, is there a collective, you know, uh, uh, you know, lower income, it's not yet a, you know, maybe it eventually becomes a, a, pri a public sector solution, but is there a way to do sort of a mid, like a public private partnership to get, you know, more buses on the roads for these folks to lower and improve their commutes? They can play video games along the way. Right, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I also think that it's not just a, we should not only think private company, sure. but industry. So you could have, like, the retail cluster yeah. could get together and say, if you aggregate, you know, a lot, of the, a lot of folks that are traveling work in restaurants, right? But almost none of the restaurants have more than 20 employees. So it's never going to be a one individual private restaurant solution set for even a shuttle. Yeah. Um, but if you said, let's take the retail cluster or a restaurant cluster in a particular geographic area and aggregate all those businesses and, and, and figure out where all their employees work, then you can have a solution. There's been solutions like that in the Midwest with healthcare systems yeah. where they essentially say, when we look at where all our employees are coming from, if we aggregated them all, we'd have enough to make an efficient shuttle-based system, which they've done. But it, it requires some sort of organizing force to say, no individual company has the right. time to think this through. <laughs> Julie, do you want to add yeah. something here? Just I, I just want to jump in quickly and say, uh, you know, one of the reasons that we think of Chariot as a first and last mile solution, so one of their first routes that was crowdsourced from the community actually went from the Embarcadero BART station to Fisherman's Wharf. And we were really surprised by that because we said, who's going from a business neighborhood to kind of a tourist neighborhood? And what we realized, it was workers that were using it as a last mile solution once they got off the BART from their East Bay kind of stop. They needed a way to get to their jobs as concierges, uh, hotels, um, restaurateurs, et cetera. And so there was no solution other than that trolley that runs every 20 minutes and costs quite a bit of money. And so that was what a Chariot was essentially used for. One of the challenges with doing kind of that longer term commute a ride sharing solution is essentially the lack of density. So people are uh, located all over in a kind of sprawled suburb way. And how do you aggregate everybody from one stop to the next? And so people have tried to make um, technology enabled casual carpool, things like that. But we haven't seen a good mid and long term range solution yet. And I'm hoping we can get there by virtue of density and other kind of factors. All right, I think if I ever want to be allowed to come back to SOCAP, I have to <laughs> wrap it up here. Um, I hope that you join me in thanking this panel. I thought this was a great, uh, really super lively conversation. So thank you all so much for coming and out thank here. Thank you for being here. Thank, thank you, you all for being here. here. 8.30. <laughs>